Today on Muscle Car, we start a brand new project that's dedicated to one of the most iconic muscle cars ever built. We've got the power plant. Now we need a car. It's what to look for in a project vehicle and how to make it authentic because we're going from NOPO to COPO. Hey y'all, we've been making a lot of progress on our 69 Olds Resto Mod. With the tubs in place and the firewall fabbed up, not to mention the rust in the doors repaired. But we're going to let it hang out for a minute because we've got to get some parts headed this way and we still got a whole lot more work to do. We could tinker on the Dodge for a bit, but we've had an opportunity to come up that we couldn't quite pass on. For a few of you out there, it may raise your eyebrow. But for those of you who don't know what we've got here, let me let you in on it. This is an all-aluminum 427 Chevrolet ZL1 crate engine, which we got from Chevrolet Performance. The original versions of these engines were only produced in 1969, and since then, they've achieved legendary status. Back then, this was the biggest, baddest Chevrolet setup that you could get. With the W Series big blocks that were introduced in the late 50s and early 60s, GM discovered that the public had a real appetite for big displacement engines, such as the legendary 409 and its drag racing counterpart, the 427 cubic inch Z11. The next generation of Chevy big blocks, dubbed the Mark IV series, is a spin-off of the old W blocks, with the blocks now being milled at the conventional 90 degrees and the chamber and valve placement being altered to improve performance at higher RPM. That valve placement is where the old nickname came from, the Porcupine. In 1966, the Mark IV version of the 427 was introduced, and it's still considered one of the Chevrolet's most successful and versatile engines. They were available in a variety of setups, from smooth idling grocery getters to racy solid lifter power plants. In 1969, the ZL1 version of the 427 was produced with the inclusion of aluminum open chambered heads and a slightly hotter camshaft. The ZL1 also featured an aluminum block, which dropped the weight from 687 pounds to 575 pounds about as light as a small block Chevy, all the while producing a claimed power level near 500 horse. And the ZL1 require 103 octane due to a compression ratio of 12 to one. If you combine all that with the price tag of just this engine option, which was over $4,000, there wasn't a whole lot of ZL1s ever produced because quite frankly, that one engine option was higher than the car it was going in. On the Corvette, the ZL1 was actually a factory option but there's another model that was never really intended to have these engines. Chances are, if you've seen this show before, you've heard the term COPO. COPO stands for Central Office Production Order, as opposed to an RPO, Regular Production Order. The most famous COPOs are the rare 69 Camaro 9560 production order units with the ZL1 engine. Overall, only 69 of these cars were ever produced with the first 50 being ordered by a single dealer named Fred Gibb, a Chevrolet dealer and drag racing enthusiast in La Harpe, Illinois. These first 50 were all bare bones, all business, street legal race cars. It took some pretty deep pockets in 69 to justify the purchase of one of these bad boys. Once other dealers found out that you could get this option, another additional 19 cars were produced, pushing the grand total to 69 1969 Camaros with the ZL1 option. And some of these cars are lost forever. Chevrolet Performance knew that this legendary power plant was close to the hearts of many muscle car enthusiasts. And in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the big block Chevy, they took and refurbished the original tooling to produce the ZL1 engine and created this, a limited series of 427 crate ZL1s. Starting with the aluminum block, employing four bolt mains, a forged steel crank, rods, and forged aluminum pistons, this setup offers a final nine and a half to one compression ratio, making it pump gas friendly. It also includes a high performance hydraulic roller cam, aluminum roller rockers, aluminum oval port heads, and a matching aluminum oval port high flow intake. Claiming 430 horsepower, that's likely a fair underestimate of this engine's potential. Each of them is numbered, and we must be pretty cool. Why, you ask? Because we actually got number 426 out of 427. This engine also comes with some other goodies I want to show you. Check this out. This is a Holley 770 CFM carburetor. It's a similar representation to what that engine would have came with back in 69. It's a four barrel vacuum secondary design that goes hand in hand with the airflow that that engine's capable of. 
In addition, this engine also comes with a certificate of authenticity. Well, it's more like a steel plate of authenticity, but it includes the production number of this engine, the engine specs, and a set of badges that are specific to this series that you might choose to use on a vehicle that you install it into. It also comes with a leather jacket with the engine series stitched on it. Now, if you're a big time Chevrolet man, all this stuff has to be pretty close to the top of the mountain for you. So this is where we're at. We've got this big, bad, big block, and we know what we want to drop it into. But it kind of creates a problem because we don't have a car. So I guess we better start digging around. That way we can build our own Copo-inspired 69 Camaro. Now that you know what we have in mind, it's time to go find a car and then get it ready for glory. What does it take to make a car Copo-like? Stick around and find out. Okay guys, we've been looking at several different vehicles for our next project, a tribute to the ZL1 Copo Camaro. Some of the rides that we've been looking at could be turned into a nice car, while the others, let's just say they take a lot of work to get there. This car, for example, is a textbook reflection of what's commonly referred to as a basket case. It's a project that's already been started by someone else, and buying a car like this can often save you a good deal of cash. But beware, oftentimes the people who are selling these cars have a really good reason to do so. It could be that the car is way rougher than they thought, or it's missing really important and expensive pieces. After beating the bushes for a bit, we finally found us a candidate. We wanted to start with a driver, not a car that needed a whole lot of sheet metal work thrown at it, or a car that was missing tons of parts that we'd have to search high and low to find those hard to find pieces. You gotta keep in mind though whenever you're looking at drivers. All that can save you some time, but it does cost you. I don't know about you, but that's American. This car is a lot more along the lines of what we're looking for with this particular project. This small block option isn't anything to write home about but it's a darn nice car from the looks of it. We know that the engine is going away when it's all said and done, so it's really more important to check out the integrity of the rest of the car. What I say, this book shows you the original window sticker. The fact that he has all the paperwork on the car is a great thing. It can tell you the history of the car in ways that nothing else can. Where it's been, who's owned it, and how well they took care of it. Here, take it for a ride. Thanks, man. Well, I'm taking the Camaro for my first little ride, and it definitely feels like a muscle car. The steering on it is a little stiff. That's because it's non-power. The brakes on it, all drum. Non-power also. So when you're getting the brakes, you have to decide. You're going left, you're going right. Well, old motor in it, this thing's got the 307, which isn't really nothing to look at much because it was Chevrolet's idea of performance with economy. And well, he really didn't hit neither one of them. See, let me show you. Did you notice I even just got on it then? Oh yeah. Oh, no, not at all. Oh geez. Private property. Better turn around. It still has the original stock bumpers and they're in good shape so they can be re-chromed. And it's got a small amount of rust in the rear quarters which can be repaired. And when you get in a car like this one with this kind of age, well, you better expect that kind of stuff. All this stuff plays a factor whenever you're talking money on these. But at least with this car, it's got all the parts and really it's exactly what we need. So I think we're gonna go ahead and take this one. Still ahead, find out why the paperwork on your project can be one of the most important parts. And it's chrome away time. What pieces did Copos have and what's going away? Well guys, as you saw, Tommy spent a lot of time and energy rolling around the country down here to find us a 69 for a Copo Tribute car. He found us a jewel. It's in really good shape. It's a baseline car. 
which means nobody's going to be upset if we tear apart a Z28 or something like that. But let's see what we've got to get started and get rolling. Although the later Copo cars were offered with the factory style GM rally wheels, we're going to go for the more recognizable Copo look in the plain steel, a little bit cleaner and even meaner muscle car look. When it comes to some of the plastic pieces on this car, which will include interior pieces on the dash as well as the grill out front, depending on what we find for damage and what's available, we'll make the decision on whether to replace or repair that item. Another area of the car which is definitely going to get some of our attention is the body trim work and bright pieces. The Copo cars came mostly as a baseline body without the wheel opening moldings, the trim on the louvers on the quarters, as well as the drip rails and the engine badges up front, which on this car are the 307s. Definitely going to go. But one piece we don't have to wait to get rid of is this right here. It is gone and out of here. This jewel that Tommy found us has got a really, really good body. The only problem here we found that's going to be major for us is like most cars of this age. Somebody's already repaired the rear quarters at least one time. We get to do them again. The seats are a little worse for wear, so we're probably going to have to do something about that. But the basic look of the interior will stay the same. Probably the biggest change you're going to see in the interior that we're going to make is going to be in the dash in the instrument panel. We're going to be going with a taller speedometer and definitely without any hesitation in the other hole you're going to see a tachometer so we can keep an eye on what that motor is doing. Okay guys we've got one major area left we're going to show you some of the changes and upgrades we're going to make to the Camaro. One is this 10 bolt rear axle. Plenty strong enough for the 307 we're taking out, but nowhere near strong enough for the 427. We're going to replace it with a GM 12 bolt and multi leaf suspension system. We'll go up through and make any necessary repairs we need to make to the sheet metal, hopefully not too many. But we are going to have to change the tunnel to make a variance in it for the four speed months you're going to put in when we get rid of the automatic. Then we'll move up and we're going to get rid of these old drum brakes. We're going to use stock style OEM GM discs. Not a major, major improvement, but trying to stay with the OEM theme, it's definitely going to be an upgrade for stopping that big motor. We've shown you most of the major areas and some of the major changes and upgrades we're going to make to the car. Not going to be all of them though. There's going to be many surprises along the way, hopefully not too many we weren't anticipating, but the only way we're going to get this project started is get it on the ground and do it. So let's go. Are you a fan of literature? Well, the paperwork that you have on your car could increase its value significantly. Like we mentioned earlier, one of the biggest differences between the 69 ZL1 Copo Camaros and a standard Camaro like we have here is they were a lot more stripped down. They had a lot less chrome and a lot less shiny bits. Since we're going to repaint the car and have to take all this stuff off anyway, let's go ahead and get started. These bumperettes are going to go away in the long run because the typical Copo didn't include them. But that sure doesn't mean someone else can't use them, so a little bit of care can get you some cash back towards your next project. We are going to be reusing the chin spoiler since it's a part of the Copo look, but the fender trim is going to be a no-no. Even though we're not going to use them, I'm going to give you guys a little tip about the stock hubcaps and trim rings. If you've noticed, you see a lot of the old GM rings on the Chevelles and Camaros that have small dents around them. That's because people leave them on the car when they go to take the hubcaps off and push against the edge of them. Take the outer trim ring off first so you're not laying on it and keep it good looking. The rocker trim gets to stay since it came on the Copos, but like the front, the rear bumperettes are destined to wind up on someone else's car. Drip rail moldings can be a real pain to remove. Sometimes you can save them, but sometimes you can't. Well, you guys that have done this before know that I cheated a little and gotten on the inside of the car and removed some panels. But getting these louvers off the rear quarters means we're just about done with the outside trim. When we went to go pick up our old Camaro, we talked a little bit about our little white book here. You may be wondering, well, what's exactly in it? It's the story of where and what our Camaro actually is. One of the things that came in the book is the original vehicle invoice. Now, this thing will tell you what exactly the car costs new and what options it came with. It can let you in on a few other things like what dealership it came from and who originally bought it. And it even tells you what they traded in on it, a 63 old Scoot. That's kind of neat. 
Another cool little piece of information that came along with our car is this tiny piece of metal. It's called a protecto plate. It was originally issued by the factories and the dealers used it whenever it came to warranty issues. This may seem a little primitive, but this was a technology that they had back then. Nowadays, it's all computerized. They just scan your VIN and it lets them know all your information. One thing I get a kick out of is these old sales brochures. And you can pick these up normally at your local swap meets and they're more popular cars, they're reproducing them. Other than the cheesy photos and the people driving the cars and their facial expressions, well, it makes me chuckle. But the images hold a lot of information. If you were doing an original restoration, these are the original cars back in the day. Now looking at the internet, you're not real sure if the cars have been altered by the images or however. Looking at these, they're dead on. Doesn't get any better than this. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty excited about this build. Having the honor to put together something as iconic as a Copo, well, that's a joy all to itself. You all be sure to stick around and go for that ride with us. If you've got any questions about anything you saw on the show today, go over to powerblocktv.com.